So this is what we have so far. So what is the domain? All real numbers. You can write it like that. Or, so this is called set notation. The interval notation is negative infinity to positive infinity, like this. It's um, a sideways 8 if you draw it. So if you want to, I drew that kind of fast, but if you want to practice drawing the infinities, uh, the way that people draw them is they do like this, an upside down U, and then a regular U, and then like this, and then like this. That's how people draw them fast. Yeah, so what is the domain all real numbers, double bar R, or negative infinity, positive infinity. It's two different types of notation, but it means the same thing. So every single x value that you can think of is going to work. Okay, and then, so we're just reminding ourselves domain is the possible inputs. Those are x values. Okay, and then down here, I'm going to sketch it real fast. We had the point 0, 0, negative 1, 1, positive 1, 1, negative 2, 4, positive 2, 4, and then we made sure that this looked U-shaped, right? So it looked, ooh, that was very pretty. Good job, Miss Rice. Oh, thank you, Miss Rice. Okay, and then did you guys draw arrows on either end because it continued forever? Marvelous. Okay, we're ready for the next one. Uh, what is the range? So the y values, now if you look here, um, actually let's write down the definition of range so we don't forget. So if the domain is the possible input, then the range is the resulting outputs. So once you have those inputs, actually input into the equation, what pops out? What's the result? So if we take negatives and we square them, if we take positives and we square them, if we take zero and we square it, if we take a number and multiply it by itself, what do we get as an answer? What happens? So if we take a positive number and square it, we get a, it gets bigger, right? We get a positive. What happens if we take a negative and square it? It becomes positive. So what type of answers do we not get? We never get a negative answer. That is not going to happen. So we are not going to say negative answers and positive answers. That's not happening. We're only getting positives. Um, can we get zero as an answer? Yeah, we can get zero. Okay. Uh, but we can't get negative one as an answer. We can't get negative five as an answer. We can get one as an answer. Yes. It would be y is greater than or equal to zero. So that is the set notation. The interval notation, the way that you would write it, is you would say, I'm going to start at zero, and I'm going to get bigger than that. Zero is my smallest number, because that's how you always write the interval notation, is you have an interval for an answer. So you say, this is the smallest end of my interval. This is the biggest end of my interval. So when we did the infinity answer, we said that negative infinity is the very smallest number I can think of. It is the most negative number I can think of, which means it is the very smallest because it is the most negative. So negative infinity is the most negative number I can think of as the very smallest. Positive infinity is the very biggest number I can think of. It is positive infinity. It's huge. So if I'm going from the very smallest to the very biggest... That's the x values. That's the possible inputs. It's everything. Then here, the very smallest number I can think of is 0 for the y for the outputs. That's the very smallest we could have. And then the very biggest we could have is infinity. So we're going to put a parenthesis here. Now, the interesting thing about this one is that 0, see how we have the equal sign there? You know how with um, when you have the uh, inequality signs, you have the equal to underneath it, or maybe you don't have the equal to? The equivalent of the equal to is a bracket. The equivalent of not having the equal to is the parenthesis. So in a situation where you would have an equal to, we put a bracket there. In a situation where you would not have an equal to sign, we have a parenthesis. 
The reason we do not have an equal to sign with a, an infinity symbol is because the idea of an infinity symbol is like, if you could ever touch that number, you should put a bracket. And if you could ever touch infinity, then I would let you put a bracket there, but we can never touch infinity. As soon as you touched it, I'd be like, no, it's a little bit further. Maybe like, no, I'm touching it. I'd be like, no, no, no. Infinity's a little bit further than that. Does that make sense? Infinity like keeps going forever. Okay. All right. Um, are we sufficiently confused? That sounds about right. Okay, let's move on. All right, the next one says to grab a different color. So let's do that. And we're going to switch Desmos to say X squared plus two. So, and what I'm actually going to have you guys do is not switch. I'm going to have you graph a second one. So let me pause the recording. So we can go ahead and answer these questions too. And it says to describe um, the difference between this graph and the graph of x squared, what do you guys notice? Okay, it starts at 2 rather than 0. What else? Okay. Uh, what should we write for the domain? So what do we notice um, about the inputs? So you're taking every number, you're multiplying it by itself, and then you're adding 2 to it. Is there any limitation for our inputs if we were multiplying it by itself and then adding 2? No, no limitation there. So for our domain, we're going to say double bar R or negative infinity infinity. It doesn't matter which notation we use. So set notation, interval notation, we are comfortable with both. All right, the range is a little bit different now because now we're not just saying, okay, I'm taking a number and multiplying it by itself. I'm taking that number, I'm multiplying it by itself, so now it can't be negative. But now I'm taking that number that can't be negative and I'm adding it, I'm adding two to it. So now it can't be negative but it's also shifting, it's increasing by two. So what should the range be for this graph? Yeah. Y is greater than or equal to two. So it's kind of like we started off with this range, we just shifted it by two. So Y is greater than or equal to two. Okay. How do we write the other notation? Yeah. Bracket 2, comma, infinity. Now, a lot of people, once we um, start doing math 3, we do range for, like, all these different types of graphs. We do a study of, like, lots of different functions, and we do range for all of them. And a lot of people ditch this notation. They ditch the set notation completely, and they focus only on the interval notation. And the reason is because um, you can say that this is the bottom of the graph for the range because range is y value, so it's up and down. So they say that this is the bottom of the graph, and this is the top of the graph. And if you look at the bottom of the graph, you could say, oh, the bottom of the graph stops at 2. So that's 2. That's the bottom. And they could say, oh, the top of the graph is an arrow, so it goes forever. So bottom of the graph is 2. I can see that. And I know it's a bracket. I put my finger on it because it stops there. And then, oh, the top of the graph is an infinity, um, which I know because there's an arrow and it goes forever. And because it goes forever, it's an arrow, and I can't really put my finger on forever, so I put a parenthesis. So a lot of people don't do this notation anymore because it's not quite so easy. Um, it's a little bit more like a conceptual type of notation. You have to think about it and understand it a little bit. Whereas this notation, you can think bottom of the graph, let me write it down. Top of the graph, let me write it down. Does that make sense? 
So in math three, we do a lot of this notation instead. All right, go ahead and finish three and four and five. So I just wanted to show you guys, that's kind of how the worksheet works. And from this point, you are using, you can kind of see Desmos, you can kind of see how Desmos works. From this point, you are using Desmos and you're kind of working your way through the exploration. Um, I don't want you to feel like you have to go slow for me, okay? So I will walk around, I will help you, but at this point, you guys can work through those first three pages and I will just be around to help you out. Sound good? Yes, Miss Rice, marvelous. Okay, so if we go back to the first page, um, if we're back at number one, number one we had drawn in pencil, right here, that's y equals x squared, and one of the things that we didn't do was talk about the word vertex, so the word vertex um, is not specific to a quadratic equation, um, and a quadratic equation, like I said, has this U-shaped graph. A U-shaped graph um, is described using the word parabola. Have you guys heard that word before? Parabola? Okay. So whenever you have a graph that switches directions like this, we call the word of um, where it switches from a decreasing graph. This is decreasing because it's going down. If it switches from decreasing to increasing, the word right here of something where it switches like that is called a vertex. So this right here is the vertex of the graph. And so the vertex of the parent function, we call it a parent function when it doesn't have any transformations. It didn't move left or right. It didn't move up or down. It didn't stretch. Um, so it wasn't, we call it stretched. If you like took the graph and you like stretched it, you made it tall and skinny looking. Um, or squish it, compress it, make it look like you take a hamburger and you like squish it when it has all that stuff on it so you can fit it in your mouth. You know you've done that. Um, so the parent graph is just y equals x squared. That's what you did before the h, before the k, before the a. Um, so the parent function has a vertex of 0, 0. So let's go right up here next to number 1. We're going to write the vertex v is 0, 0. When we shifted the graph up to, what was the vertex for the graph that was shift, uh, shifted up to? Zero, zero two. And that was something we had described this when Peter described it. He said he described it as starting at zero two instead of starting at zero zero. That was one way we had used to describe how it was different. Um, for number three, we took the graph and we took the k value. We made it a k value of negative three. And that meant that it had shifted down three. What's the vertex for number three? Okay. You have to write zero negative three. Writing just negative 3 is misleading because you don't know if it went to the left or if it went down. So you need to write two points, one for the x-coordinate, one for the y-coordinate. Say it again. All I'm hearing is... Is that killing the baby? No, maybe. It would be a unicorn probably, yeah. All right. Next page. So actually, hold on, let's write our conclusions. So our conclusions here, which we already kind of talked about, but we did it off camera, was that um, the k value shifts the graph up if it's a positive k and down if it's a negative k. Up if it's a, a positive k, down if it's a negative k. That is our official conclusion. So k is the number on the end of the equation, up if it's a positive k, down if it's a negative k. Okay, um, the H is a little bit weirder. So here, uh, for number six, we have X plus two squared, and it gave us this drawing. What is the vertex for this one? What's the vertex for this one? You didn't write it down, but we're going to write it down right now. Negative 2, 0. So this is, we'd write negative 2, 0 for this one. So let's go ahead and write the vertex for number 6. So for the graph x plus 2 squared, 
um, it has been shifted to the left to, and for the vertex, we're going to write negative 2, 0. For the graph x minus 3 squared, it gave us this one. And what should we write for the vertex? Vertex is positive 3, 0. Okay. What the h value does? It does left or right, but what? which one's which? Yeah, so it's kind of like the opposite of what you would think, which is a little bit strange, a little bit less um, easy to remember. So it shifts the graph left and right. A positive H moves you to the left. A negative H moves you to the right. If you mix those up because they are strange, you will kill a baby giraffe. I know, I know. It had, it had to be a dead baby animal because they're so easy to mix up because it is... It is not normal. It is counterintuitive that they should be backwards like that. So it does not make sense. It is very strange. Okay. All right, let's flip the page. Um, so for this one, this one is kind of interesting as well. Um, lots of things happening here. So we had a 2x. Um, can you tell which color I did for the 2x? Yeah, the blue for mine is the 2x. So what does that do? Yeah, it makes it appear to be skinnier. So we call that a vertical stretch. Um, and you should specify vertical versus horizontal because um, it is possible to take a graph and horizontally stretch it this way. Um, and it looks different. It's a different um, letter. In calculus, if you look over on the board right there, you would take the, see the X inside the parentheses. I should have put a little squared in the equation and I missed it. But you would take the X and you would put a B in front of the X inside the parentheses. And that would be a horizontal stretch or compression. So, um, so for number 10, we have the A, uh, we have y equals a, and then in calculus, pre-calculus, you start having a b like this. And the b allows you to have horizontal stretches and compressions, and we do not deal with the b in math 2 or math 3. So it's going to be a while before you see the b. But for that reason, whenever I say stretch, I don't just say stretch, I say vertical stretch. Because there is a point where you're going to learn about horizontal ones. Okay, so when I say stretch, I'm not just going to say stretch, I'm going to say V stretch for vertical, vertical stretch. So that blue that you can see on mine, the graph isn't just tall and skinny, it has been vertically stretched this way. Does that make sense? Vertically stretched. Okay, now the one half in number 11, what color is that on my page? Can you tell? The dark blue. The dark blue on my page. So that's kind of like the hamburger that had too many toppings and you couldn't put it in your mouth. You squished it. You compressed it. So it has the appearance of making something look short and fat. You squished it down. So we call that a vertical compression. You squished it down. Okay. So you can say V-C-O-M-P is how I usually shorthand it. Vertical compression. Okay. Uh, what happens when you put a negative in front of the graph? Yeah, it reflects it over the x-axis. As you can imagine, we can also reflect over the y-axis. And so we're not just going to say reflected. We're going to say reflect over x. The way that some people um, shorthand this is they say reflect over x. Rocks. If you want to write that, that's fine. I have never gotten in that habit but you're welcome to do that. Yes, Jack. That's really descriptive. I like that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Most people don't phrase it that way. Um, it will, when I grade your papers, it'll take me a second, but you are not wrong. Okay. For the transformations, um, you're not wrong, but it's still going to be good to learn reflect over X. Reflect over X. All right, and then for the pink one, we had it reflected over the X, but it also was vertically stretched as well. 
the negative and the three at the same time was two transformations stretched and reflected over x. What is the vertex for all of these? Zero, zero. So let's go through and let's put that vertex for all of them. Zero, zero. Zero, zero. Zero, zero. So what I wrote is that if A is negative, it's reflected over X. If A is negative, it's reflected over X. And then the size of the number of A tells you if it's a stretch or compression. So if that A is bigger than one, it's a stretch. If it's smaller than one, it's a compression. Notice I didn't say anything about A equaling one because A equaling one is normal. You're never going to see a coefficient of one written because one is normal. So we don't typically just put a one there because that's like, duh, okay, cool. That's typical. So that was the goal for what you would get out of the exploration today. That's what we were hoping for you to find. Any questions about the things that you should have noticed today? Yeah. Why wouldn't you like the Oh, yes. Sorry. I, oh. oh, no, you're right. You're right. For the reflected over X, I should have said less than, and I was, I was just going through quickly and not paying attention. Thank you for pointing that out. So what Avery had pointed out is that for these ones where the graphs had flipped upside down, my range should be y is less than or equal to zero. And if I write it in that interval notation, that would mean that the graph starts at negative infinity and it goes up to zero at the very highest. And then it stops. And I had gotten in a zone and had missed that. Okay. If you flip the page, the rest of this is kind of like, okay, so you learned it, so now what? So the goal of these is to take some of those ideas from... Um, the different transformations and to start to apply them. So Desmos is going to be a good friend in this to, to maybe guess and check and plug in some transformations and see what works. So if you look at this one, what transformations are you seeing? What has the graph done? It's upside down. So what do upside down graphs have in their equation? They have an A. And the A is negative. Okay. And then what else does it look like it has? The vertex isn't at zero. It's like plus, it's up. Okay. So we're going to get on Desmos. We're going to make sure that we have an A value that's negative. We're going to make sure the graph has shifted up. Right? So I'm going to say Y equals, I'm going to have an, a negative in the front. Now, has the graph gone left or right at all? No. Okay. So I can just put x squared. I'm not going to need any parentheses in there. Um, how much does it look like it has shifted up? It looks like it's shifted up 9. So what you can do is you can take Desmo when you're doing these, and you can double check on Desmos and check that equation and see if it works, if it makes sense. And if you check the points, so Desmos will always let you click on, Desmos will always let you click on the vertex. It will always let you click in the y-intercept. It will always let you click on the x-intercepts. So you can always, on Desmos, you can always click on those and make sure that those are the same. So if we click on those and we compare with that graph, does the vertex match up? Do those x-intercepts match up? Yes. So we have a pretty good um, idea that that's, the correct answer. So my vertex is 0, 9. All right, so for sure, I want you to do this page, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
do this page. I have not looked at this next page. It's wonky. Mm. I'd say give it a shot, but don't 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 like struggle don't with cry it. At the over. Don't cry at the kitchen table over. Yeah. So if you can do the problems in like I don't know ten minutes, then go for it. If your brain starts to hurt and you and your face scrunches up a little bit and you start to cry, then just like put it away, okay? All right, do we feel like we can do the problems? We feel empowered? Marvelous.